profile audience. This is Margaret Preston, president of Power Over Parkinson's. And today I'm so excited to share with you the interview I got to conduct with Dr. Sonia Mather. Dr. Mather is a co-chair of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. She's also a board member of the Davis Finney Foundation. She's on the Medical Advisory Board of the Parkinson's Canada. She's also on the Medical Advisory Board of the Bryant Grant Foundation. She's an executive of the Parkinson's Movement North America. She's the board director of the Lake Ridge Health Foundation, as well as the chair of the Development Committee. Finally, she's, on the editorial board, uh, she's an editorial board member of the Journal of Parkinson's. And most notably, Dr. Mather is a person with Parkinson's. We were so excited to welcome her to our Pop Profile series. Listen now as she goes into depth about her journey to diagnosis at just the age of 27 with Parkinson's disease. So as we get started, let's talk a little bit about your journey of diagnosis. Um, you, you were one of those folks with young onset Parkinson's at the age of 27. Um, so tell me how um, that diagnosis, what that diagnosis, what the journey was to diagnosis. Sure. It'd be my pleasure to do so. Um, you're right. It was young. <laughs> I was uh, 28 at the time that I was diagnosed and it, it all started out as a tremor in my pinky finger, actually. Mm -hmm. And as a physician, I was just newly into my um, practice. I kind of thought it was more medically intriguing than anything else because I'd heard of my patients describe a tremor mm -hmm. and to actually experience it was kind of interesting medically to me. But then I soon realized that this wasn't something to be interested in yeah. because the tremor continued to become more persistent and consistent and really wasn't going away at all. So it got to the point where it was noticeable by my husband, who's also a physician, and he said, you know, you have to get it checked out. So I went to a colleague at the clinic that I was working at and, you know, just over lunchtime, kind of casual thing. But by the end of his discussion with me, he had given me a diagnosis of young onset Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't believe him. Right. <laughs> and thought that, yeah, thought that you know, I can't believe I've been sending my patients to someone who's clearly incompetent. <laughs> um, but uh, that was, you know, that was a shoot the messenger sort of situation because he, you know, referred me for a second uh, opinion to probably one of the best um, neurologists in our country. And um, he confirmed the diagnosis. So I was 28 at the time, okay. um, pregnant with my first, expecting my first child. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just had begun my career as a family physician. Yeah. So how long, uh, from the point of kind of starting to observe that tremor in your finger to diagnosis, did it take you? For me, it was rather short. Okay. Um, it was within a year. Okay. Um, but that's unusual. That's very yeah. unusual. Yes. If you talk yeah. to anyone in the community. Mm -hmm. There's a, such a period of misdiagnosis and, and not knowing what is wrong mm -hmm. because typically the presentation is not that typical. And, and also the medical community, mm -hmm. especially at that time, I mean, we're talking now 23, 24 years ago for me. Right. Um, it was, it was not thought to be a disease that someone my age yes. or, or even being female could, yeah. could really come down with or, or yeah. to present with. So it's, it's an unusual situation that I was diagnosed so quickly. And that first neurologist was actually very good at this job. Definitely, definitely. And it's a bright spot, I'm sure, as you've reflected how far we've come, right? And understanding yes. age doesn't necessarily play into it. Gender doesn't. So I agree. Nice see the, the growth in the industry. It, it has grown to some extent, but we're still hearing stories about it. You know, there's still... Um, and and it and it is because some of the atypical nature by which young people present with Parkinson's. But again, it's still also the medical establishment, and in, in the large part, I'm not talking about specific movement disorder specialists, but medical establishment in general really still doesn't recognize that this disease goes beyond yeah. a certain demographic that they're right. used to seeing. Right. Right. Well, uh, Sonia, because you were diagnosed so early in your life, um, I have no doubt that Parkinson's has played a significant role um, in your career and just the way you've probably chosen to show up in this world. So how do you think it's changed that diagnosis? How do you think it changed you as a physician and your overall aspirations? Um, it's, it was a very interesting thing um, for me. It was a great learning experience, both for myself and my husband. I think it influenced the way we approached medicine. Um, for me, it made me see my patients as per people, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't just someone with high blood pressure coming in. It was someone coming in. 
Mm -hmm. um, because I began to recognize that, you know, patients were much more than the, their, their diagnosis that, um, you know, if I'm making changes to their treatment, I'm, I have to take into account the side effects, for instance, mm -hmm. I have to take into account whether or not what I was treating was the right thing. For instance, with Parkinson's disease, if I were to give a patient more medication because their tremor was a bit worse that I was observing, A, am I creating side effect that might be worse than the tremor itself, right. which a lot of our medications can do? Right. And B, am I actually addressing the, the, the issue that is affecting their quality of life? Maybe it's not the tremor. Maybe they're happy enough with the tremor, but it's the constipation or depression that's keeping them from enjoying their life experience. Mm -hmm. So looking at the patient as a whole person, understanding that diseases affect all aspects of life, mm -hmm. not just what I'm observing. Right. And um, also focusing on quality of life for patients. And, and, and that includes a, a vast uh, you know, amount of, of, of areas, not just the, the disease symptom itself. Yeah. Well, you're in a prime position, not only treating those with the disease, disease, but also at firsthand experiencing it to define what it means to have Parkinson's. How do you describe what it means to have the disease? And everyone's definition is different, right? <laughs> everyone's definition, just like the disease presents differently in everyone, everyone's life experience is different. Everyone's definition is different. Yeah. Um, I would sort of describe it as sort of a loss of control. Mm -hmm. Um, the one aspect, I mean, I, I like to be in control of, of situations, and this is the one thing in my life I'm not that much in control of in terms of its progression. It's unrelenting. It's unforgiving. It doesn't matter whether I have a meeting today. It's not going to necessarily bow down to my schedule mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or yeah, conform yeah. to what I need to do. So it's, it's unrelenting. It's unforgiving. And it's progressive. Um, you know, that's, that's the reality of it right now. Um, but it, it also doesn't, you know, people will say it doesn't define you. It, it actually doesn't define me. Um, it's, it's something I, I, I have to deal with, but a lot of people deal with a lot of other different life circumstances. This happens to be my challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that uh, right now um, I have to live with and, and sort of have to try and live around. So, you know, it, like I said, everyone's life experience is different, but this is just one of those challenges that I wake up to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, needless to say, um, you touched on in the prior response symptoms you can see and symptoms you can't see. So needless to say, there's so many important physical adjustments that one has to make, um, while living with the disease, but there's so many, um, overlooked emotional adjustments when mm. you live with the disease. So did you, upon diagnosis, did you initially tend to those emotional needs or um, some folks can just kind of compartmentalize and put them away and deal with them only when they become a big issue? Um, did you initially uh, deal with the emotional side? Um, and if so, currently right now, how are you navigating the emotional changes on how you kind of have a relationship with the disease? Right. Much differently now than before. I would say that for the first 10 years, of my diagnosis, I, I kind of describe it as a dance with fear, anger, denial, and secrecy, mm -hmm. um, because I was just so not, not ready to accept the diagnosis. I mean, intellectually, I accepted it. I knew I had Parkinson's disease sure. and I had to do, yeah. but emotionally I had not come to that um, conclusion. So um, I sort of busied myself with busyness, ignored it completely, you know, went to an occasional doctor's appointment, took my medications because I needed them, mm -hmm. but really kind of not just compartmentalized it, but tried to push it as far back into the closet as possible because yeah, I wasn't yeah. ready to deal with it. Right. But then I came to the point, to be honest, where I didn't like what I was becoming. You know, I normally was a very optimistic person, always hopeful, laughing, and I, I really didn't feel the joy anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I was becoming very pessimistic. I was always focused on what I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And um, that was not the type of person I wanted to be. So I came to a point in my life where I had to make a decision, you know, what was I going to do to change my life circumstances? Because mm -hmm. I began to realize, we, you know, we have no control over the diagnosis, but mm -hmm. how we face the challenges that this diagnosis brings is really up to us. And it, that, that part is in our control. Yeah. And, you know, optimism is a choice, mm -hmm. not an easy choice, <laughs> oh, it's, it's not a choice nevertheless. Yeah. And so that's when things started to change for me. And I began to emotionally accept it because without that emotional acceptance, you can't really move forward. You can't right. move beyond your disease. You can't sort of take control 
of the situation. So that that was a turning point for me. Um, and now now that's what I choose. I mean, I'm human. Every day is not a good day, right. either physically or emotionally. But I allow myself that day. You know, I'm only, like I said, it's, it's a natural thing to feel. Mm-hmm. But I pick myself up and I say, well, you know, tomorrow could be a better day. What mm-hmm. can I do to make it a better day? Yeah. And sort of say, it's my choice now to focus on the positive that I have. I have beautiful children. I have a loving husband. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I look around the world and I think, you know, my situation is really blessed in a lot of ways. So mm-hmm. that's sort of reminder that, you know, things are what they are. And yeah. yeah. There's no choice but to move forward. The other choice is, is to succumb to it. And that's not what I'm prepared to do. And I love that um, one of the takeaways that you just shared is almost, um, at least early on, if you do kind of shove that emotional side in the closet, that becomes more debilitating than the disease itself, because you're only harming your attitude, which then harms everything else. So yeah, you can't, you can't, forward. you can't, yeah. you can't concentrate on what you need to do. Mm-hmm. You can't, you know, rely on others because the whole secrecy thing was a big thing for me. I didn't tell anybody for a number of years, except for my husband yeah, and um, some, a couple of close friends um, because I was afraid to rely on others for support. I didn't want a pity party. Right. Um, right. But that, that again, you know, that kind of denial really harms you because now that I've, you know, come out, so to exactly. speak, um, right. it's been a world of support, which made exactly. a big difference. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to pivot um, to your experience as an author. Um, this is one of the my most favorite aspects of your bio, having kids um, and purchasing one of the, the books. Um, you, you really helped facilitate dialogue between children and their loved ones. Um, you authored books called My Grandpa's Shaky Hands and Shaky Hands, A Kid's Guide to Parkinson's Disease. Um, what did writing those books and making them a resource to other families mean to you? I guess what prompted that? And then what ultimately did it mean to you? Well, as I mentioned, um, I had, I was expecting my first child. Yeah. I was diagnosed. And I went on to have two other daughters. I have three daughters now. Okay. And when they were younger, we were very, we didn't hide anything, but we didn't really name it until they were a bit older. And right. that's when they sort of came to us and said, you know, we, we feel like you have something going on and let's talk about it. And, and, they, and, and, and that's sort of the, how the conversation started. I think we had come back from a a fundraising opportunity in New York. And we said to them, so do you know why we go to these fundraisers? And my middle one, who was probably about six or seven at the time said, because you have Parkinson's disease. And that was sort of a turning point for me. And I thought, well, these children know a lot more than I think they know. (laughs) They're so in tune, right? (laughs) And that's what sort of prompted me to think about how we were going to approach it with them and and the language that we were going to use. And and, and what we needed to do in order to make sure they were well adjusted to the situation. And that's where the books came into play. Mm-hmm. And um, the sh- especially the Shaky Hands Kids Guide, I wrote that with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and sort of tried out all the verbiage on them first. Yeah. Yeah. And see what worked. And it really became um, almost a therapeutic process to write that book with them. Yeah. And um, I think it's important because, like you said, children are intuitive, right? They know something's going on. Mm -hmm. And if you don't explain to them what's going on, then they often make stories up in their head that are probably worse than... Correct. (laughs) Correct. The other thing is children are eternally optimistic. That's their natural state is to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that's important. So if you look at the books, they have a very optimistic vibe to them because I think we need to honor that, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, if a... And it really depends on our own reaction. You know, if a child, if a toddler falls, mm-hmm. the first thing they do is look at their parents and they <laughs> Am I hurt? <laughs> you know, how should I react? Yeah. And if the parent reacts, you know, gets all flustered and upset, then the child's going to get upset. But if the Absolutely. parent says, you're okay, pick yourself up, you can, you can yeah. go on. Then they tend to do that. So the, the, the sort of angle that I took with this was very optimistic and also empowerment. Mm-hmm. I think we need to empower our children to yes. know what to do when they have a loved one affected by this disease. I think that's very important to give them actual, you know, um, um, tasks that they can do to help the, the one that they love that that's um, living with this disease, I think is important. So overall, I, I hoped that it would help other families as a com- conversation starter mm-hmm. um, so they can approach something that can be scary to kids 
um, if it's not, you know, sort of approached in a, in a, in a open way. And I love that you provided them with a pen throughout the book, um, because hearing their, in their own words on the sidebars, their experiences, I think will resonate so well with kids. It's not just necessarily an adult, just giving them facts they can hear from a peer almost about how they've navigated or how they perceive the disease. So I love that you gave them a pen to, to add to it as well. Yeah, it was great. That way. It was uh, fun. Well, at present time, um, we, of course, know wellness and exercise, um, even on days when we don't want to do it, is so important to everybody, everybody, and especially those with Parkinson's. So at present time, what is your exercise regimen? What do you like to do and what works for you? What I like to do and what I do do are two different things. <laughs> because exercise, well <laughs> exercise, as he said, is necessary for all of us. It's good for our heart. It's good for our lungs. It's good for mm-hmm. our bones. But it's especially good when you have something like Parkinson's disease right. in order to help with your movements, um, your stiffness. The this, this disease sort of pulls you in and you have to kind of stretch it out. So mm-hmm. um, strength is really important. Balance is really important. So there's lots of specific things for Parkinson's patients that are important to do. So that's what I try and focus on myself. So my, my day usually begins with exercise. Um, I get up, I do something cardio, like walking and nothing, nothing too strenuous. I tend to walk on the treadmill for about half an hour. And then I concentrate on weights and yoga. I think yoga or some sort of stretching routine is really important because as I said, the, the, the sort of, um, MO of the disease is to pull yourself Mm -hmm. in and tighten Mm -hmm. your muscles. So I think that's really important. And I focus on, um, strength. Yeah, um, yeah. as training as well, as I, as I mentioned, and, and balance, balance work. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really important. It doesn't really matter what you end up doing. I think it's important to do it safely. Yeah. You know, um, taking into consideration your other aspects of your health, as well as your, you know, your balance and, and your, your ability to, you know, history of falls and things like that have to be taken into consideration, right. but just do what you love and mm-hmm. do what you love every day. Mm-hmm. Is, is really good. If you love to dance or love to Zumba or, yeah. you know, um, uh, love to just go on hikes and do that, but it's important to keep moving. It's when Definitely. we stop moving that, that the trouble begins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you remain positive throughout your disease management? Um, what's your process? We noted bad days and they're inevitable. So what's your process for ha- handling those bad days? Um, not beating myself up over it again. Like I said, giving myself permission to have those bad days is the first thing Mm -hmm. because I found what I was doing before was saying, I feel bad and I feel bad that I feel bad. (laughs) And I feel bad that I'm in this loop. (laughs) And that's very counterproductive. It doesn't doesn't help you any. First, accepting the fact that I'm going to have bad days was the first step for me. Mm -hmm. And then being mindful of my situation, looking at also, you know, a mindfulness in terms of what can I do in order to avoid this tomorrow, or if it's a physical thing, or also mindfulness in terms of what I do have, as opposed yeah. to what I don't have that day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of mindfulness and being aware of your situation, and kind of working yourself through the details of, of why you're feeling the way you're feeling. It's, it's a lot of introspection, I think, mm-hmm. that, I, that I've done. And, and also just kind of you know, giving myself those pep talks, reading those quotes that, you know, keep me going yeah. um, are helpful, yeah. you know, journal reminders. Absolutely. I think sometimes it's nice to have kind of this, whether it's a calendar tear away or some of those yeah. quotes just present, because if your mind's not doing it for you, at least you've got something to kind of yeah. get you there, right? Exactly. If, you're, if you're not there just yet. Um, well, of course, as we kind of pivot talking about, um, research and cures and all that good stuff that's happening in this world right now. Um, a complete cure would, would obviously be ideal, but if we, if we don't have that yet, let's say we have a magic wand instead. Um, what would be the first symptom of Parkinson's disease that you would want to eradicate and for researchers to solve? Oh, that's so interesting as a question. Um, I like to say them all, but of course not. <laughs> I think probably, you know, it's really the non-motor symptoms I think affect people's quality of life the most. And I mean, that's the thing we want to do whatever will optimize quality of life. I think the mood changes that people get with Parkinson's disease are particularly like the anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that if we could, you know, really 
eradicate would be great. Yeah. The pain that people suffer mm -hmm. um, with Parkinson's disease would be great. And the on and off swings, you mm -hmm. know, where you kind of cycle between. So I know that's a few of them, but really no, no, everything affects people's quality of life. And it's really about whatever, in each individual, it'll be different too, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever in an individual that will optimize their quality of life the most is, is what I would go for, but that's okay. not a great answer. No, I think it's great. It's a good handful of things that, especially your first one being mood. I mean, that's overarching yeah. and something yeah. that if that's not there, um, then how do we tackle the physical and the rest of it? So, um, yeah. being open to assessing your mood is step one, right? So, yeah. um, and, and recognizing that it is a part of your Parkinson's and it is a yeah. medical situation. It's not just that you can't adjust to it. You can't snap out of it. You can't, right. you know, cope with it. Those are also issues that people face, but, you know, sure. true anxiety and true depression are medical issues Yeah, they need to be addressed that way. It's not something you're necessarily going to pull yourself out of on your own. Right. Right. And being able to have those conversations with your doctor um, and feeling right. comfortable to do so. Um, yeah. Well, as we know, Parkinson's has, like we talked about, an array of symptoms and everyone has it differently. So um, there's so many that maybe folks on the outside are unfamiliar with. So um, if I could ask you, and this, this would probably be a uh, person specific again, but if I can ask you a symptom that you'd like to cast a light on that um, is little known or not necessarily thought of to be part, part of Parkinson's, what would you like to cast a light on? Which symptom? Um, I think pain. Mm -hmm. I think we still don't recognize that Parkinson's is a painful disease. Mm -hmm. um, and that's from personal experience as well as, you know, talking to people in my community. Yeah. Um, it's painful. It's painful mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. It's painful because the muscle spasm, it's painful because the dyskinesia, it's painful mm -hmm. because of the lack of movement mm -hmm. and the stiffness. There, there's neuropathic pain, but the, it's a painful disease. And I don't think we focus enough on treating the, that pain and, and alleviating the, that symptom for patients. I think so too. Um, you don't, you don't hear a lot. Um, I think most people just think about that tremor, uh, mm -hmm. a, a painless tremor uh, mm -hmm. when they think of it before they're really in tune or understand the disease. So I think that's right. such an important one. And then of course, that's a debilitating one that I think almost ties back to the mood because it's debilitating and then your mood sets in. So um, there's such connectivity, of course, between the symptoms too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, would you say you have experienced any silver linings as a result of being diagnosed with Parkinson's? Oh, if, we're thinking, if we have our optimism hat on that, yeah. that we're striving <laughs> for, which is hard every day, but what would be your silver lining? Oh, you know what? There are actually silver linings. I mean, um, and that's not to minimize the effect of the disease, but if you look at the silver linings for me, um, the first one would be that you know, I, I stopped clinical practice in terms of my family medicine practice about 12 years into my disease um, because it just wasn't working for me. I couldn't maintain this, the pace, but I probably have found my life's true calling in a way. I mean, I'm very passionate about what I do and, 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 and the work is really fulfilling. Um, and it wouldn't have happened had I not had to step away. Yeah. Um, although I enjoyed family medicine immensely as well. The other thing is silver lining is it gave me time to really be present for my kids because medicine itself is very um, consuming and your schedule is not your own. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have missed out a lot on my children growing up um, mm -hmm. had I not been home or had my own schedule to manage as opposed to um, an office schedule. And the other thing is the people that I've met. You know, there are so many remarkable people that I call friends in this community, you know, my Parkinson's family, and I would have probably never crossed paths with any of them had it not been for, for this disease and the ins inspiration that they give me on a daily basis and the support that I feel from them um, on a daily basis is, is really a, a blessing. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, it's, it's almost, um, time. It gave you more time than you probably would have otherwise had having a busy family practice. It gave me time, but it also gave me, um, gave me mindfulness, awareness of my time because I didn't take anything for granted yeah. anymore. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, well, it, we talked about some of uh, the research world, but there's so much exciting research being done um, related to Parkinson's. So uh, what research project or projects uh, are you most excited about seeing coming down the pipeline? That's a great question. I'll tell you about the difference I see. Mm -hmm. um, when I first was diagnosed with this disease, it was all about dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all research was directed towards, you know, replacing dopamine, being effective at that process. But now I think we are gaining more insight into the actual ideology of the disease and the yeah. passive physiology behind it. Mm -hmm. I think we're not, we're sort of thinking, we've been thinking outside the box. We understand this is a whole body disease. It's not just a tremor. It's not just a motor disease. It's not just about dopamine. Other neurotransmitters are involved. So I think that sort of the, the research that's going towards greater understanding of this disease, I think has been most exciting for me because you can't cure what you don't know. Yes. And we really have to know this disease um, in, in terms of, of what's causing it in the first place. You know, a lot of research is going into the pesticide mm -hmm. factor, the environmental factors that may precipitate um, Parkinson's. So all these things that are sort of looking at what causes this disease, mm -hmm. how it evolves, I think that's most exciting for me because we need to know that before we can move forward. Definitely. I love that you touched on that because as you said, so for so long, we there was such a siloed um, kind of tunnel vision on dopamine. And now with such expansive research being done related to the gut and all those things that yeah. happened 15, 20 years prior to that, maybe related to pesticides. Um, and all that is just so much more than the word dopamine. Um, so thank you for, for noting that. Um, well, Sonia, as we close, uh, share with our listeners, I know I was um, quickly able to find you and find lots of information about all the work you're doing, but share with our listeners how they can learn more about you um, and your joint advoca advocacy um, and where they can get a copy of some of your publications we noted. Um, I have a website called unshakablemd.com. That's where a lot of my stuff goes on to, including the links to the books. Um, and there's also another group that I helped co-found about a year and a half ago called the PD Avengers. Mm -hmm. It's pdavengers.com. That's a global advocacy group. We now have close to 5,000 members and um, more than almost 90 plus international organizations that have agreed to partner with us to sort of improve wellness advocacy and research in Parkinson's disease. So pdavengers.com is the other place to, to gain some information. Perfect. And we will put those websites um, up at the end of this presentation as well. Um, so, you know, I know your story has resonated and will continue to resonate with so many people, especially in our community. So I can't thank you enough for your time today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Honestly, it's always great to, to chat about things and hopefully help somebody out. But, you know, I'm also very easy to get a hold of through my website. So don't ever hesitate to reach out. Perfect. Thank you so much.